thing. We are in week three of our Christmas series, Christmas Playlist. We are looking at Christmas carols and the, uh, the profound biblical truths that are in them. There are some profound biblical truths in these carols that our emotional well-being, our, our mental well-being uh, are being improved this, not just this holiday season, not just these few weeks of December leading up to Christmas, but I'm believing for every season, for, for this whole new year, this, this series is preparing our hearts, preparing our hearts for joy in the new year. That's what track one of our Christmas playlist was. We looked at joy to the world, and we saw how important joy is to our life. But we got to choose joy. We've got to choose it. We've got to find it. We've got to recall it sometimes. And most importantly, we've got to spread joy because it's a joyless world. And as we do that, we we find hope billows up within us. And that was our, our second track on Christmas playlist. Last week, we looked at Oh Holy Night. And we looked at how important hope is in the life of the believer. And we saw that sometimes we give away our hope. And I shared with you about how I gave away my hope. We we bought a dog, a new dog, a week before Christy travels 8,000 miles away. A lot of you this morning have asked, how am I holding up? How are you holding up, Pastor John? I'm telling you, I'm doing great. I am doing okay. The kids, they're alive. They're smiling. We're doing good. The dog is another story. Thank you for asking, Sister Susie. That dog has decided, I don't even want to go into it this morning. It's a trial, and I need my hope. I need my hope. My hope needs to be rejuvenated. And to rejuvenate that hope, sometimes we have to live in total obedience, total freedom, and total surrender. And that's what we looked at last week. We're now three weeks in, and I bet you you've kind of caught the trend that maybe you've noticed the pattern that the song during our time of worship is the song that we cover that morning. And so it won't be too surprising that the third track on our playlist today is Angels We Have Heard on High. And this morning, I want to share with you just for a few minutes about the questions that we should be asking, the questions we should be asking. Let me pray for you today. Father, I pray for your people. I pray that they would receive your word from you the way that you have spoken it to them. God, I pray that you would help me, help me to deliver it the way that you desire today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this carol, it recounts literally the birth of Jesus. It recounts the birth of Jesus from the point of view of shepherds. These shepherds, they were literally the very first people to see baby Jesus, or if they weren't the very, very first, they were among the first people to seeing this newly born king. Um, This carol covers a passage of scripture that you're pretty familiar with in Luke chapter 2. I want to read to you a few verses starting off in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 8. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them do not be afraid i bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today in the town of david a savior has been born to you he is messiah the lord this will be a sign to you you will find the baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising god and saying glory to god in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. I'm going to stop right there for just a couple of moments. Because, man, that, 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 that passage of Scripture, what, it talks about what an incredible night that was. When supernatural invaded natural. When God's son's official residence stopped being a permanent mailbox in heaven and became a P.O. box on planet earth, you know? A temporary place, but a place nonetheless. A night so unordinary and so unique that God saw it fit to send angels to celebrate and to commemorate it for all time. And it's a night when this group of men who were in a field, who were only there because it was their job, they had to be there. They had to be there making sure that sheep were safe from predators. And because they just happened to be there, because they needed to be there, 
they became eyewitnesses to the greatest news break in all of history. On a typical night, the skies might have been clear and the moon was full. They, they, there would have been a little bit of light. There, there's been some clear nights here this week as I walk our two dogs for like 30 minutes out in that field for only one of them to do their business. I have been impressed and just amazed at the clarity of the night sky this week. That, that the full moon, it just illuminates the, the surrounding area, and there's a little bit of light to be able to see. However, this night that the shepherds saw was different because when the angel appears, they can see in full detail, up close, what, not because of the, the, the moonlight, but because of the radiance of God's glory shining. Because that's what happens in God does, God does in darkness. He illuminates darkness. And these shepherds, they see skies explode with light and with sounds and hundreds, if not thousands of angels fly in synchronized flight, celebrating and proclaiming a newly born king. And when all of that calms down, it might have been 50 seconds, it might have been 50 minutes later, these men, they make a choice and they go to see for themselves all that has occurred. Let's continue in verse 15. When the angels had left them, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at the, what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And that's what this entire song is about. But right in the middle of the song that we sang this morning, between angels singing and shepherds traveling, there's something that's not included in our text from Luke chapter 2. I see it's an interview or, or maybe it's an interrogation of these men. Verse 2, someone is trying to figure out why these men are different now, why they have been forever changed. Each week I've told you about the part of the song that does it for me, what's inspired the message. What has inspired this entire message today is the questions that the songwriter asks in verse 2. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why this disposition that you now have? This attitude of celebration, this attitude of jubilation, this attitude of exhilaration. You used to be angry and grumpy all the time. You had to deal with dirty, stupid sheep. And you let everyone know about it. And you left for work that night so angry and so grumpy. But when you came home, you were never the same again. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strain prolonged? I keep on imagining that they're not just talking about what they saw, what they experienced for the next couple of hours. It carries with them for the rest of their life. And I keep on imagining them talking to different people about this. And people keep on coming up to them and asking, why are you talking about this still? It's been five weeks. Get over it. It's just a baby. Or it keeps on going and they're like, it's five years. That baby's now a kid, and they don't even live here anymore. They moved to Egypt like three years ago. Oh, it's been 20 years. Why are you still talking about this baby that's now a man and probably is, is married and has kids of his own now? Why this joyous strain prolong? It's been 35 years. Didn't you hear this baby? He grew up, and he's, he's dead now. He's been crucified. It doesn't matter how many years passed, the song of praise did not fade. The joyous strains of that night, they keep going and going and going. What's this gladsome tidings be which inspire your heavenly song? All this good news that you keep on talking about, it's all you ever talk about is the good news. All these people, they're asking a lot of questions, and that's what an encounter with Jesus does. It gets people talking. It gets people talking. As I think about the questions that we were 
just looking at it got me thinking about how we are at the end of the year and a lot of times when we're at the end of a year a lot of questions start to pop up in our lives and in our minds things that we ask ourselves that we want to find out about ourselves what, what do we regret about this past year what is it that we wish we could change about us that we could carry into 2023 the most important question of us all why why am I not losing weight right now? What, what is it going on in my life that I keep on gaining weight and not losing weight? And there are these questions of introspections, questions that give us direction for the incoming year, questions that point out our flaws, our inadequacies, and our insecurities, and the things about us that we want to change. And these questions are not improper or inappropriate or wrong, but for the basis of our message today, I want to say that they're not the questions we should be asking. As you live the last three weeks of 2022 here, they're not the questions we should be asking. The questions that we should be asking is, what is going to bring my praise? What is going to bring my praise? Joseph, you kind of already preached the message this morning, man. What is going to bring my praise? What's going to bring my praise this next week? What's going to bring my praise this next year? What's going to bring my praise when I'm sick again? What's going to bring my praise when I'm stressed out again? What's going to bring my praise when I'm out of money again? What's going to bring my praise when I don't feel like giving my praise again? Are people going to be able to come up to me and kind of ask that same question, not of shepherds, but of me, John, why this jubilee? John, why your joyous strain prolonged? John, why the glad tidings that be in your life, which inspire your heavenly song? Maybe you've never asked yourself this kind of question. Maybe you've never felt like you needed to know what's going to bring your praise for any part of kind of season. So this morning I want to share with you three things that I believe are going to help you bring your praise no matter what. First of all, to bring your praise no matter what, we need to inventory what God has done. We need to inventory what God has done. Every week of this series, Brother Chris, he's been telling me about how the series is really stretching him. It's really stretching him. And he makes sure I always know why it's stretching him too. And it's not for the reason you think. It's not because of the message. I'm not saying that the message isn't challenging you, brother, but I'm just saying you let me know that it's because of the carols we're singing. <laughs> he always tells me, Pastor, I didn't grow up in a white church. I didn't grow up in an Anglo church. He spouts off some song that he's familiar with. I'm like, I don't know that song. He's like, yeah, welcome to my boat. <laughs> I don't know your Christmas songs. He's like, this, this, this series, it's stretching me. Every now and then, I'll ask you, brother, about a hymn. Hey, man, you ever hear this hymn before? I consider them popular. I consider them well-known. I, I think a good portion of us in this room would do that. You know, I'll fly away, oh, glory. And yeah, yeah, sir. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. While I was writing this point this week, a hymn popped in my mind. I didn't even bring it up to you. I know what the answer is. <laughs> I, I, I know what it is. But some of you might remember, I'm, I'm going to get the tune totally wrong, so I'm not going to try it, but some of you might remember this verse. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And that's just the first verse of the song. The rest of the song, it goes on to talk about you're living in burden and carrying a heavy cross. When you're, when you're living in lack or, or in, when others begin to prosper and you're living in that deficit of between the two. When you're living in conflict, great and small alike, don't be discouraged when those things happen, but count your blessings through it all. King David, he wrote a psalm once, counting his blessings, Psalms 103. The entire chapter is an inventory of what God is doing and what he has done. He says, let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Oh, he forgives my sins and he heals my disease. He redeems me from death, and he crowns me with uh, love and tender mercies. 
He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. And he goes on like that for 17 verses, recalling the incredible things that God has done, recalling the incredible attributes of God's character. Let me tell you this morning, my praise is not dependent upon how he's going to bail me out this time. My praise is not dependent upon how he's going to show up in my life this time. My praise is not dependent upon where he's going to take me to this time. So the question we should be asking is not, what is God going to do for me this time? The question we should be asking is, is what has God already done? What has already done? We need to take an inventory of what he's already done. In high school, my very first job was with Radio Shack. I didn't work for them long. It took me forever to get a job. I was stubborn, and my parents said, I'm going to get, go to fast food, go to McDonald's, go to Taco Bell, go to Burger King, get, get a job. And I was not going to work for fast food. I dug my heels in. I'm not working for fast food. Finally, finally, finally got a job with Radio Shack, and I was going to be moving to Florida a few months later. So I was in with them for under a year, but I learned something about myself in my short time with Radio Shack. I hate inventory. Oh, I hate inventory. It's dull. It's tedious, especially at Radio Shack. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it's one thing if you're at a Best Buy or something like that, but inventory at Radio Shack with the thousands of batteries and uh, fuses and transistors, resistors, and all the other intricate electronics that were null and void and sent them out of business years ago an inventory of what God has done. It's none of those things, though. It's refreshing. It's life-giving. It's life-giving and refreshing to my praise life. We need an accurate inventory of the peace that he is in me and for me. We need an accurate inventory of the provision he has supplied. We need an accurate inventory of the protection he has manifested. That one's fresh in my mind this week because if you ever made a stupid mistake on the road, I made a stupid mistake on the road this week. I was, I went out to lunch with an individual. I thought, what day was it? It was Wednesday. I went out to lunch with somebody and I was taking him back home and he lives in frost proof and I'm not familiar with the area. And I stopped at a, at a stop sign and I thought it was a four way stop and it wasn't. And I kept on going. I pulled out in front of a car and that car had a swerve. And I thank God for his protection upon my life. And that inventory of his protection upon my life has been so evident in my mind this week. It has spurred my praise this week. My praise requires me to look back and take an inventory of what he has done. I might have to look back in my prayer journal. I might have to look back in my sermon notes from weeks past. I might have to look back at seasons of my life I never wanted to think about again. But when I look back, it won't matter. And I can't see the end of what's ahead of me. Because all that matters is that I know the one who has stood with me through it all. Amen. Inventory what God has done. Secondly, this morning to bring praise no matter what increase your exposure to praise. Increase your exposure to praise. Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5. He says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Oh, when it comes to the ways that I can express myself to God, there are multiple gates that I can go through. The question I should be asking this morning is, which gate am I going through? Which gate am I going through? Is it the gate of continual complaints? Oh, God, here's my list of all the things that are going wrong in my life again. Is it the list or is it the gate of cynicism? Cynicism, the beliefs that God, he has nothing good for me. Is it the gate of sarcasm? Is it the gate of anger to God? I can either choose attributes in my life that promote or stifle a lifestyle of praise. And the more I allow the attributes that stifle my praise, the harder it is to bring my praise. Praise is a choice. Oh, it's a choice. We have the choice of our exposure level to praise. 
We can keep it at arm's length, keeping it far away from us. Or we can embrace it whenever or wherever we can. We can choose our participation level on a Sunday. And we can choose how we respond to praise in the week. There's always a choice when it comes to praise. There's a choice of what we could do and a choice of what we should do. We could choose actions and attributes that justify our selfish nature. Yet we should choose actions and attributes that increase our exposure to praise. The shepherds chose an increased exposure to praise. They chose to go and see in Bethlehem this thing that the angels had had talked about. But they're not the only ones in the Christmas story that increased their exposure to praise. Eight days later, Mary and Joseph, they take baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. And while they're there, they run into a couple people. One of the people that they run into is a prophetess by the name of Anna. And Anna was a woman who understood the value of continual exposure to praise. In Luke chapter 2, verse 36, it says, Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to, widow to the age of 84, and she never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping with fasting and prayer. And she came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. And she talked about the child to everyone who had been, she had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Decades. Decades of being at the temple, night and day, living a life of worship, fasting, prayer. And it enables Anna to see Jesus as more than just a child. She sees him as the one that she has been expectantly waiting for. And all she could do was bring her praise to God at that moment. I wonder how many times over the decades and over the years and over that time that Anna didn't feel like bringing a praise. She didn't feel like it, but yet she lived in increasing exposure to it. She's at the temple night and day, and she's able to bring her praise night and day, even when she doesn't feel it. I'm telling you this morning, when you have an increased exposure to praise, whether you're feeling it or not, you'll find a way to do it. And as we increase our exposure, we see how our view of God, it shifts. Because we see his faithfulness differently. We see his goodness differently. When circumstances of my life aren't good, I can only see him as good. When it appears like I'm all alone, Emmanuel, I see right there with me. He's never leaving. He's never forsaking me. The desert season of my life are not the time to limit my praise. They're the time to increase it. So the question that we should be asking is not how long or why must I worship him this season, the question should be, why would I ever want to stop? It's good to be still and know that he is God. It's good to be the avenue in which he is exalted among the nations, exalted over the earth. Increase your exposure to praise. Finally, this morning, to bring my praise no matter what, invite others with you. Sometimes praise is all we can do. We know when it's time to praise, when we're at the end of our rope, when we don't know what to do, when we think all is lost. But we know that the only thing we can do is throw up our hands and praise. But praise is not meant to be experienced alone. David, he was so excited and happy when he got an invitation to go and praise. Psalms 122, verse 1, he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. The question we should be asking is not what praise is going to do for me. Rather, what is praise going to do for someone else? Because the times that we see others going through the same things I am, 
Oh, that they're, they're at the end of their rope too. They don't know what to do either. They think all is lost as well. And what they needed most is what David needs this most. They needed an invitation to the house of the Lord. They need someone in their life who can be like David's friends. They can come up to them and they can say, oh, I don't have an answer for you, but I know where we can go. Let's go up to the house of the Lord. They need someone that when they're sick, they can say, I don't know why you're sick, but I know where we can go. Let's go on up to the house of the Lord. They need someone in their life who they can come up to them and say, I don't know how this is all going to end, but I know where we can go in the meantime. Let's go on up to the house of the Lord. I see how you're in adversity right now, how you're anxious, how you're stressed right now, but let's call on up to the house of the Lord anyways. I see how you're in a season of blessing right now. Oh, it's evident. God's hand is upon you. His favor is with you. His provision has been great in your life. Let's go on up to the house of the Lord. Oh, inviting other people to church. Yeah, that's, that's a small part of what I'm talking about with the house of the Lord, but I'm literally talking about taking the opportunity to invite others to praise, pray right then and there. Oh, and the people in the Bible, there's people, they would just erupt into praise. Anna, she just erupted into praise. The shepherds, they just erupt into praise as they leave. They didn't wait for a building. They didn't wait for a specific day of the week. All they had was the invitation of opportunity. And there are people in your life that need that from you to provide an invitation of opportunity. Oh, it doesn't have to be weird. It doesn't have to be loud. It just has to be genuine. When I worked for Geico a few years ago, I would see these two guys. I don't have any clue who they were. There's a few thousand people that worked in that building. But every now and then, when I was working in the morning, coming in at a certain time, I, I would see them outside the building, locked arm in arm, praying with one another. Several times a week, I would see that. They would just be solidified in unity in that way, inviting one another to stand with them. We need that kind of friend in our lives. That they see what is going on and say, let's go to the house of the Lord. It does not take a lot to turn an ordinary moment into a holy moment. And honestly, it doesn't even take more than one person. But for the sake of the spirit of this point today, remember the words of Jesus. For where two or three are gathered, he is there. So invite as many people as you can to join you in his presence. At the beginning of the message, I shared how the shepherds had a choice to make. They went to see for themselves all that had occurred. And there came a moment where they were done I I don't know what what spurred the moment on maybe Mary said okay it's time to leave I've been traveling for days and I've been labor for hours I'm tired I'm going to bed time to go home guys I I don't know maybe it's baby Jesus maybe he's a colicky baby or something like that and they just got tired of the crying I I don't know maybe maybe just the the smell of the being in a barn just drove them away but whatever it was there came a moment where the shepherds went back They went back to the fields. They they went back to the sheep. They went back to work. And when they went back to all that they had left, they went back glorifying and praising God. This morning, you're not a whole lot different from the shepherds. You made a choice this morning to see for yourself what God has for you. And so you made the choice to get up on a Sunday morning. You made the choice to get out of your pajamas on a Sunday morning. You made your choice to come and get with other people when you don't like dealing with other people in the morning. And it's a much easier choice to just stay at home. 
And as our time together, it's kind of winding down here this morning. You're also in the same boat as the shepherds. You're about ready to go back. You're about ready to go back to the errands that need to be ran. You're about ready to go back to the schedule that needs to be kept. You're about ready to go back to the people that need to be dealt with. And all that you're about ready to go back to, the question you should be asking this morning is, am I going to bring my praise with me? Am I going to bring my praise with me? My praise, it's not about me, it's about him, but that does not mean it's not beneficial for me. God does not need my praise, yet he deserves it. And I don't deserve to give it, yet I sure need it. Our praise game must remain strong. Praise strengthens our faith. Praise fulfills our purpose. Praise propels our hope. We need it. So when you feel like it's fleeting this week, I want you to remember these three things. Remember to inventory what God has done in your life. He is so faithful. Remember to increase your exposure to praise. Don't pull away. Pull up a YouTube playlist. Pull up Spotify. Pull open your Apple Music. Whatever source of music you've got. A few weeks ago, Brother Lewis was here. He was helping us work and work on the building. We're painting the building. We're doing different things every single day. Man, he pulled out that phone, and he's turned on his playlist, and he had that playlist of praise going around with him all day. Increase your exposure to praise this morning. Invite others with you. Don't praise him alone. Don't praise him alone. This morning, would you bow your head and close your eyes with me today?